it's Easter time now. And of course, this means this is one of the highest holidays for the Christian religion, based on the idea of the resurrection of their savior figure. When I did my talk some time ago about the historical Jesus and possible idea of him not being historical, at the end of the Q&A, one of the questions came up about a interesting approach to calculate how probable it was that Jesus actually rose from the dead, done by Timothy and Lydia McGrew. These two people who are primarily philosophers went through and did a Bayesian analysis and came to the conclusion that the evidence for the resurrection was amazingly good. When I say good, they gave it a number of 10 to the 44th power. What does that even mean? It's a number so large it's hard to wrap one's mind around. That's 10, that's a 1 with 44 zeros after it. And of course, when we're talking about evidence, what does that mean? So let's do a bit of a comparison. If you do a paternity test, the best you can probably find out in the market will say that they're nearly 100% going to give you correct results, but they'll say there's a 1 in 100,000 chance that something will be awry. So we're talking 10 to the fifth power that a paternity test will give a correct result. So according to the McGrews, with their evidence based on the New Testament, their evidence is a thousand, 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 thousand times better than the DNA evidence that shows that your father is your father. That already might tell you there must be something wrong with such a calculation. Could any record prove such a thing? Again, let's do a comparison. A letter from someone you don't know claiming to be your father and saying that they're your father versus a DNA test showing that that person actually is your father. Which of those two lines of evidence do you think is better? And of course, with the letter I'm mentioning, that's actually somewhat favorable to the hypothesis since the letter would probably at least be somewhat contemporary. It's not a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy written centuries after the fact by people of unknown origin with various political and theological motivations. So things don't seem quite right. Part of the problem with the calculations that they also run is that they assume basically the total reliability of the Gospels and that they were authored by the people they claim to be authored. That's pretty much going against the massive consensus of Bible scholars on many things. For example, that Matthew wrote Matthew and was an eyewitness to the events that he describes. This has been outside of mainstream for a while, but the McGrews will point to evidence about how people in like the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century and such, for example, believe that Matthew wrote Matthew. They even show an example of someone who put in an interpolation claiming at the very end of the Gospel, this was written by Matthew in Palestine in this year. Somebody interpolated, meaning they lied what they put in there. And the very thing that they lied about is evidence for the truth of the thing they lied about. Welcome to Christian apologetics. This is going to be a bit rough if you're going to use these calculations and have to go against so much that Bible scholars have already established. The dependence on one gospel and another, that they're of uh, later antiquity than the original eyewitnesses, they aren't actually even motivated to write history. But let's try to see if we can run some other numbers and do some probability estimates right here and now. And let's assume that the authors are as good as any historian of the time. Actually, let's do even better than that, because if you actually do what the McGrews did and say they're just as good as the historians of the time, it's a little bit shaky. For example, Herodotus, one of the earliest historians of the time, tells us stories about giant gold-digging ants out east. Do you believe that because Herodotus wrote that? Probably not. Or how about that armor around the oracle at Delphi came to life and fought the Persians? Same author. We also know that historians of the past made things up and even told us they did. Even the best, one of the best historians of the time, Thucydides, said he made up all the speeches, what they should have said for the time. But let's do even better than that. Let's say that these authors of these gospels and such were extraordinarily good at what they did. So we'll assume lots and lots of reliability. We won't nitpick and say, well, that's not historically true. And we also want to include the testimony then from Paul. And we also want to include the testimony from the Book of Acts, written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke, or most likely as most scholars think. Let's look at some of the numbers if we just do that. 
because there's one interesting thing that happens that's mentioned at the end of Matthew. We are told that after the resurrection and all the sightings, some people saw the Jesus and did not believe, did not believe he was the resurrected son of God. That's a bit weird, isn't it? How can you actually see Jesus walking around and not believe he is actually resurrected? This strangeness, maybe we can explain a bit if we look at some of the other numbers that we are given about earliest Christianity. According to the book of Acts, after Jesus ascended up to heaven, that's not question that that happened, there were approximately 120 people in the earliest church before they then went public at Pentecost, which was then about a little bit more than a month after the time of the resurrection. Now, we're not sure, of course, how the author of Acts knows that number, but again, we're going to just assume that it's correct. One other thing also we're told in the works of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and he talks about all these people who saw Jesus after the resurrection, including Peter, the Twelve, himself, of course. He also mentions over 500 brethren that had seen Jesus. So let's assume that these 500 are seeing in the same way that we're supposed to believe that Peter and others had seen him. Now, were these 500 people seeing Jesus before or after? Jesus had ascended to heaven. If it's after, then that's going to have its own promise. But think first off if they saw Jesus before he ascended to heaven. That would mean then we went from over 500 people seeing Jesus down to 120 followers right at Pentecost within about a month's time. Going from 500 people who saw Jesus but aren't part of the church anymore, that means they don't believe, right? In other words, 75% of the people who are said to have seen Jesus didn't believe what they saw. That's 75% of the eyewitnesses contradicting the claim. And that's at best. Paul says over 500, so it could be close to maybe 80% attrition rate. And this is again within a month before memory would fade or anything like that. And of course, having Jesus to hang out with for several weeks before he ascends to heaven and people like, no, that doesn't seem right. So if you have 75 or more percent of people not believing these things, then you have the vast majority of the people saying, who were in the know, this wasn't true. That already is a pretty bad probability. The only way to save that is then to claim that these 500 people were after Pentecost, and that 120 figure then grew from 120 to 500 and so on. In which case, when Paul says they had seen Jesus, it couldn't have been in the flesh because he had already left Earth, again, assuming the story that we have from the Gospels. So in that case, how did they see Jesus? It seems to be the same way that Paul describes how he saw it in a vision, a revelatory experience, a hallucination. Downside of that, that means the vast majority of the people who said they had seen Jesus hallucinated. And considering that Paul uses the same language for his viewing as he does for those 500 and for also people like Peter, that would indicate that everyone who saw the resurrected Jesus saw him as a spirit, as a hallucination, basically. So either you can take it that the vast majority of eyewitnesses do not believe the claims that Jesus rose from the dead, or just about everyone who did think Jesus rose from the dead, rose from the dead in some non-bodily way and only saw the spirit of Jesus. Either way, that makes the probability of the resurrection look very bad just on that evidence alone, and we've already given the best possible, considering that we are not getting any inauthentic things. Now, of course, there could be interpolations into the letters of Paul. Maybe he doesn't mention 500 people. Somebody inserted that, which, of course, means then we are having people doctoring the evidence. And if they do it there and make up lots and lots of witnesses, you think they could just make up a few women at a tomb? Just from those considerations alone, we would have to believe just on the evidence alone, not even considering things like the improbability of miracles, that this is a rather shaky story. And when we also know the background of how the Gospels were created and how they're full of things that are very implausibly not true. Consider, for example, that they talk about three hours of darkness covering the entire world. And of course, we don't have any records of this anywhere from China to Mesoamerica. And one would think that would be noticed. Or how from Matthew, again, supposedly our earliest Gospel and eyewitness, claiming that there was a zombie horror that had invaded Jerusalem and it was seen by many. But nobody seemed to write that down. 
when we see that these sorts of stories are of the fantastical and at best the witnesses would say against it, we have good reason to think that Easter Sunday was just another Sunday back in Palestine and nothing particularly interesting happened. If we truly want to, of course, run and do some probability estimates, we'd have to look at a lot more evidence, but it only goes downhill from here because I gave it the best shot, assuming the authenticity of everything that was said. And of course, we have plenty of other things that we could doubt, including there even was an empty tomb seen on that Sunday, or that Jesus was even buried in a tomb in the first place. Since we can only make the evidence look worse, the probability can only get worse. And do we really then have to do any more serious digging when we can see that even at its best, it's bad? Happy Easter.